Hello, my lovely viewers. Today's episode is an exceptional one as I will be interviewing a registrar in the area of psychiatry. He is an international medical graduate. But before that, if you haven't watched my recent interviews on MTI opportunities for specialist doctors worldwide in the United Kingdom, how to migrate and work as a doctor in Ireland, how I became a scholarship magnet, another interview with a multiple scholarship award winner, I would urge you to check on my channel and watch these videos. International doctor watching or international medical graduate or you know anyone who's interested in this, please don't forget to share this link to anyone you know. And I believe we are all going to benefit a lot from this. Don't forget to drop your questions in the comment section as well. Don't forget to like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. I've got uh, Dr. Ayamiko with me. Hi. Hello, Mirat. Lovely joining you this this yeah this time for this. Thank you for inviting me. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know we've been talking about this, you know, for some weeks, so I've been getting to a month now. Um, I do appreciate the fact that you found time out of your busy schedule to share, you know, your experience with me and with viewers out there. So thank you so much once again. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Maybe what you want viewers out there to know. Yeah, so um, as you said, my name is Ayo Mikbo. I'm um, a psychiatry registrar in the UK. I finished mm -hmm. medical school in Nigeria, which is my birth country. Started psychiatry training there, then moved to the UK. Mm -hmm. Worked a while as a middle grade doctor, did the exams, and then now I, I'm trying to complete the specialty training. So I'm an ST4 I'm in the history of England currently. All right, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. So can you tell us what motivated you to specialize in psychiatry in the first place? Okay. And then why did you choose the United Kingdom? Yeah, so, you know, when you tell most people that you, know, you want to specialize in psychiatry, the first question they ask is, why psychiatry? Um, but for <laughs> me, it's, it was a no-brainer. I suppose it has to do with, mm -hmm. you know, my personality, the fact that I enjoyed the posting medical school. Um, I think for me, psychiatry mm -hmm. was the one posting where the seniors, that is the registrars, the senior registrars and the consultants, did not especially go out of their way to make you look like an idiot. <laughs> so, so I loved, <laughs> I loved that about, um, you know, the seniors and I loved the, mm. the theoretical aspect of psychiatry. The fact that it's a good combination of the humanities and, um, you know, biological sciences, your so-called hard sciences like neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, mm. but also some sociology, some psychology. So it was that, a mix that um, sold psychiatry for me. And also I think, this is my own pet view, that only psychiatrists are the real doctors, that all the ah. doctors are not real doctors. <laughs> and I will explain why I say that. You see, in psychiatry, right. you, you, don't, um, you don't treat the brain. So cardiologists treat the heart, isn't it? And yeah, yeah neurologists treat the brain or the nerves. But psychiatry you have to treat the whole person so that's why a few psychiatrists are the are the only real doctors of course all of us should be <laughs> patient centered but in psychiatry you have no other choice you have to be patient centered mm -hmm. if you want good outcomes i think the surgeon can yeah they, they can get away with cutting out the appendix and not even knowing the name of the patient but the psychiatrist cannot do that mm -hmm. wow that was really deep Yes. Um, well, I don't know if the other doctors there agree with you, but he's really selling psychiatry out there. So let me know what you think in the comment section, viewers. Right. So why the United Kingdom? Okay. So so um, yeah, that's because of the difficulties in Nigeria. That's the short <laughs> short answer to that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's it. I. I never really wanted to leave my birth country, all of through medical school, my house mm. job, FY1, and even what we do in Nigeria. I don't know if you are familiar with this National Youth Service. Um, that was when I started thinking about okay. leaving the country. Um, as I said, the political mm. climate of the country and also peer pressure because all, all my friends were leaving. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was that. And okay. then there you have much money mm. to pay. So you feel, oh, wow, I could make mm. some extra bucks, so let me leave. And of course, the cutting edge um, technology that you can access here, the opportunities. Okay. Yeah, those were the reasons why I came to the UK. 
and it's easier passing oh, the exams, okay. not like the USMLE that takes a lot of money and a lot of time. So PLAB was easier to pass, mm. shorter. So I did that. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. It's good to know. Yeah. Um. So there are various routes um to pursuing psychiatry in the United Kingdom. I believe. I was yeah. wondering, could you just give us an overview, you know, of the various routes, um, especially international medical graduates use to pursue okay. psychiatry as a residency program in the United Kingdom? Okay, so I'll start with the gold standard route. So that's you finish medical school, do the PLAB and get the GMC registration, then do the okay. MSRA and apply for specialty training in psychiatry. So and that's mm -hmm. through whole well. You apply for posts in psychiatry. You do three years of core training during which you pass the MRC psych exams. And also you have mm -hmm. good ARCP outcomes. ARCP is like an appraisal for a trainee to see that mm -hmm. your educational needs have been met and that you're progressing in your training appropriately. Then you do three years of specialty training and then you get um, a CCT, so certificate of completion of training with which you can apply to be a consultant on the GMC's specialist register. So that's the gold standard um, route to becoming a psychiatrist in the UK. And what I've said is a summary. So say, for example, you want double CCTs, that could be four years for higher training or five years of higher training based on which CCTs, which subspecialties you want. But apart from mm -hmm. the gold standard, there are other various routes, like the one I took. So I had psychiatry training in Nigeria. I've almost completed my core training um, in Nigeria. So when I came to the UK, I was working in a, in a service provision job. I did the exams. I had a supervisor who was confident that I'd met the same competencies that core trainees would meet. So I applied for the exams and applied for mm -hmm. specialty training and then I got in. So that's the, that's the other route. Uh, but for that, you need okay. a PLAB. So you need to be in the UK first. You need to evidence that you have the same competencies that um, core trainees have. You've had a mm -hmm. similar training to theirs and then you pass the MRC psych exams. Um, the other route many people take is the MTI, Medical Training Initiative, where the mm -hmm. RC Psych itself and some trust would um, sponsor doctors from low and middle income countries to come to the UK, get um, exposure to UK practice and ideally go back to their country. So that's for two years. So with that, people get GMC registration and some refuse to go back to, to their bad countries <laughs> when they're done. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Um, and of course, so, so you can, if, if you're doing that and then you've, you've, you're in UK psychiatry, then if they don't, if they don't want to go back, then they can apply for service provision jobs, like specialty doctor jobs, uh, junior clinical fellow jobs, um, mm. and they can also choose to then go through the core training um, the classic route, which is very well defined, and I would actually suggest is the best, um, which mm -hmm. of course is the gold standard. So those are some of the some of the ways. I know also if you you know say someone is a consultant already in in Nigeria or in Ghana or wherever, and you don't mm -hmm. want to go through the hassle of um, um, yeah starting all over again, you could do the MSc like exams from mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, and then either. Uh -oh. Yes, and with that, you get the GMC registration. So you could then apply for middle grade jobs, for service provision jobs, um, or you could then do court, um, specialty, specialty training. So that's the higher training for three years. And you can apply from your birth country also, once you have the MRC psych. You don't need PLAB for that, just the MRC psych. Wow. You know, in a few minutes, you've just given us an overview. You've told us about the various routes and yeah I, I hadn't heard of most of them so I believe people watching you know have, have learned a lot from this and at least I like the fact that you gave you know the various um, routes for let's say um, a doctor who's finished house job kind of thing or someone who's even done a bit of specialty or residency training in the home country and even for yeah. consultants as well so that that was really really helpful thanks for that You're yes so now let, let's narrow down to your experience with the MRC psych. Um, can you describe your experience, you know, with, with the MRC psych examination? Okay, so, so the MRC psych exam is meant to be the gold standard, you know, UK psychiatry exam. So, um, right. but actually it's easy to pass. 
many people are really? just thinking, oh, this is a very difficult exam. But it's it's a it's it's easy to pass, you know, uh, because they they will ask you what you know. You know, so that's that's it. Mm. And of course, you need exam. You need to have exam competencies and approach to how to pass an exams. But generally speaking, it's what you know. It's what you do in your daily clinical practice. So there are three um, different papers. So there are the, the theory papers, paper A, paper B, and the clinical one is the OSCE. So that's the CASC. Um, that's the um, mm. clinical assessment of skills and competencies. So that's, um, I think, 16 stations, seven minutes mm. each or throughout the day, but that's the last step. So that, let me start with paper A and paper B. So paper A, any doctor can do paper A. Once you're out of medical school, you, once you have an MBBS, MBCHB, you can apply for paper A. And paper A is basic sciences. So neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, sociology, um, yeah, genetics, things like that, pharmacology. So that's what paper A is about. So these are sciences mm -hmm. basic to psychiatry. Then paper B is the psychiatry exam so that's you know general psychiatry forensic psychiatry service provision in the uk and where people struggle is the statistics the clinical appraiser part of paper b um mm. i guess because that's not part of our everyday clinical work isn't it so some people yeah. struggle with that but their materials their books their question banks if you're in a training program which is one of the reasons i said that is the gold standard there's usually an MRC psych course, so where you you will be taught, mm -hmm. you know, what to expect, what to know, how to prepare for the exam, and also there are private um, courses that people do for the okay. paper A and paper B, and then for the CASC, this is clinical, um, you know, patient encounters, explaining to patient relatives, diagnosis, management, speaking to a member of the multidisciplinary team, risk assessment. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 a vignette of what you do on your day-to-day -day clinical practice. Okay. Wow. I mean, it's reassuring hearing, you know, from you <laughs> that the exam is not you know, that difficult. Yeah. So, yes, I hope someone out there is excited <laughs> hearing this. Um, I know you've mentioned some resources, especially for those in core training. I'm talking about MRC side courses and other, you know, private ones. Well, maybe later I'll ask you for some links to some general ones out there in case people watching want to know of these resources. Um, so for you, um, are there any particular training or development opportunities, you know, you have pursued since starting your psychiatry training? Whether I mean, maybe any other things that people could sort of do to, you know, yeah. um, help them yeah, in this in this training program? Yeah, in fact, one of the good things about psychiatry is the breadth of what you can do. I mean, the breadth mm. of what one can do in terms of, say, research, uh, you know, wow. academic mm. stuff, patient engagement, leadership, medical education. It's it's just really endless. And I was lucky, I was fortunate to have a supervisor who was um, interested in my career growth and who pushed me and um, showed me various um, things I could do. So since I came to the UK, I've um, contributed chapters to three textbooks. I've done research, wow. I've published these research, I've presented at international conferences, at regional conferences. Um, currently, I'm a training editor with the RFC Psych Books Committee. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah. so those are some of the things I've done. So really, there is a lot of you know, yeah, opportunities for that in in psychiatry based on your own personal interests. So my own personal interest is, um, you know, clinical and academic. Seeing the nexus between the between the two, what we're doing clinically, what is evidence based, and then mm. pushing the boundaries of knowledge. So that also includes medical education. So which I also do. Yeah. So I'm on a faculty of um, one of the medical schools in the Caribbean. Uh, they send the medical students here, so I facilitate their psychiatry posting. So it's not paid, so I don't earn extra for that. Uh, but yeah, okay. yeah, it's something I enjoy doing, so so it's good. Wow, that sounds brilliant. Because you know that what people, some people have invited is okay, a typical psychiatrist. You just see a patient, just try to help them with their mental health issues, and that's it. But it's good to know the breadth of opportunities available. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. so that's. Yeah, that's really good to hear. 
Yeah, for people who are interested in management mm -hmm. too, there are mm -hmm. the courses the RC Psych offers about management and leadership. So that's something wow. some of the people may want to do. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, but that's not my own interest for now. So I've only spoken oh, about right. my interests. Yes. Your interests. Wow. Yeah. So even with your interests alone, I mean, there are loads out there. So yeah. viewers, you, you can imagine, you know, other things available, other other um, sectors that you could also look into so so that's that's really really good to know um so in everything we know there's a the good the bad and the other um we want to know can you just highlight some challenges that international medical graduates um going through this psychiatry journey and the uk residency program are likely to face if there okay. are any i believe there may be some yeah there are actually there are. About. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mabel. So psychiatry is the same everywhere, maybe except for the US that uses DSM five, but even then it's it's the same. The only challenge okay. that I think IMGs will face is understanding the NHS, the system itself, and the, men mm. the UK mental health act, because various countries have various mental health acts. Um, so understanding I mean, the legal aspect of managing people with mental illness, when to section a patient, how to treat patients against their will, capacity. So I think those are some of the issues mm -hmm. that trainees may have or new people, people who are new to psychiatry in the UK may have. But positively, okay. when you join any trust, there will be induction. So you'll be taken through some of these things. So it's, it's, it's going to be a learning curve, but it's not some insurmountable so all of us mm -hmm. get to learn, mm -hmm. learn that yeah mm -hmm. the other thing is that uk psychiatry um emphasizes the multidisciplinary team a lot so for people mm -hmm. who come in from say um very traditional settings where the doctor is the boss you know and you tell everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> how to live their lives <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you yeah. will find it a bit different here because it's a multidisciplinary team you have everyone working together to um, support the patient of course the doctor will still be the head of that team clinically speaking mm -hmm. but may not be the, mm -hmm. the head management wise yeah so mm -hmm. so people may find that a bit odd you know coming from our background where you know the consultant is is, is the boss everywhere um so i think those are some of the, the challenges also the the demand i guess people may also be surprised by the demand because say back home mental health is not so public a lot of stigma the stigma in the uk exactly. too but, but people are still aware so you have a, a great demand for mental health services sometimes i worry that even um you you may you may see the worried well you know as part of your normal um everyday clinic mm -hmm. clinics um yeah i think those are some of the challenges again the presentation of illnesses will be colored by the culture so the cultural mm -hmm. context around making a diagnosis and managing patients maybe something people need to learn and the various accents in various parts of the uk can also be a challenge <laughs> to navigate so yeah okay yeah. wow thanks for sharing that um Let's go to the nice aspect, you know, the benefits, um, salary, if you can just highlight <laughs> that. And yeah, that, the other yeah. thing, the perks of being yeah. a statue registrar. Yeah. 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 So the salary is the same for trainees. So there's a national body that deci decides how much you earn. So whether you're a surgeon or an, a hematologist or a GP, it's roughly the same salary. But for psychiatry, mm -hmm. you get um, a premium paid every year of course it's paid every month so that's to say oh thank you for for being a psychiatrist because we don't have any oh, psychiatrists oh. in the uk so so there's a premium <laughs> that you 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 get and also the work life balance is very good yeah personally mm -hmm. i don't like that term work life balance because most people use it to mean oh if you want to be a lazy person then come and do psychiatry um <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but really, <laughs> every job should, you know, cater for your personal life anyway. And psychiatry does that very well. So in psychiatry, it is understood mm. that you have to bring all of yourself to the to the workplace. So there is a lot of support mm. to ensure that you're flourishing both at work and also outside of work. And the, the pleasure, the sheer pleasure of, you know, getting to know people in their, in their time of distress and being part of the solution. I think that's that's just mm. priceless. Yeah. 
Wow. Wow. Actually, my next question was going to be on work-life balance, you know, and the psychiatry field or being a psychiatrist in the UK. Um, so what are the work patterns like? Okay. And if you can throw a bit more light on the balance, because I know some people may not want the stress, you know, of being a doctor, like in the hospital, maybe other specialties like surgeons, you know, on calls here and there and stuff like, like that. So um, yeah. can you just tell okay. us about how the psychiatry work schedule is generally? Okay. So for trainees, you do nine to five, Monday to Fridays, and then you're on call um, mm-hmm. during the week and also during the weekends. But based on how many trainees are there, so it differs from place to place. Um, but that's the general mm-hmm. rule. You work nine to five, either in the hospital, or if that's your posting, or in the community. So communities like outpatients, um, seen patients outside of the hospital. And then you're on call where you also see patients who are admitted in the hospital. You admit new patients, um, support the nurses on the ward and things like that. But mm-hmm. again, this is general mm-hmm. for the UK. You can do less than full-time training. So it's not specific to psychiatry. But you can do less than full-time training if you have personal circumstances or reasons to to do that. Um, so I guess the difference is, say for the surgeon, you have to be in clinic all the time and then still run your your, your theatre list and still do ward rounds. Whereas for the trainee psychiatrist, if you're in a community team, you are with that team for, say, six months or one year. Um, if you're on the inpatient team, you are with that team for, say, whatever specific a number of time you will be with them so so your your day is usually well planned and most of the time you'll have um, secretarial support admin support to book your clinics wow. you can choose when you want to see patients you have especially as a higher trainee as a registrar because this is you're now training to be a leader in the multidisciplinary mm-hmm. team so you have a lot of options to decide how you want to work um mm. yeah yeah okay so let me just ask, how much time are you giving to see patients? I know like people complain, GPs have just 10 minutes to see patients, yeah. things like that. Um, how is it like? Yeah. So the minimum I book for any patient, the minimum is one hour. So if I'm doing, wow. yeah, yeah. If I'm doing like an, um, a, an ADHD assessment, for example, I would do the first assessment would be say two hours. Of course, there will be breaks in between. If it's a follow-up appointment, mm-hmm. I will still book one hour, but sometimes we finish in 30 minutes, sometimes we finish in 45 minutes. And I can't do what GPs do where the CP is <laughs> in 10, 15 minutes because that's when I'm just done saying, hello, how was your, how was your day? <laughs> you know, how was your night? So, yeah, so I, I book one mm-hmm. hour minimum for, for the patient. And then if, if I finish early, then I can do some of my admin, writing up the letters, speaking to the GP mm. during that extra time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, well, I know I can identify with you a bit because we are both from West Africa and I, I believe doctors are watching from all over anyway. Um, can you just highlight some of the key differences in psychiatric care? practices between the UK and your home country, um, which may apply to people watching from, you know, elsewhere. I know you talked about, you know, some of these things early on in our con- conversation. I'm just wondering if you can just point out some others, if there are any, um, yeah. so people will be aware. Yeah, I think the, the first thing I would say is the manpower. So back home, um, the number of professionals is very, very low. I remember when I was still mm. in Nigeria, for a population of 200 million people, we had less than a thousand psychiatrists, way less than that, consultant psychiatrists. Mm. So the, the the demand to the supply, mm, it's, uh, it's better in the UK, um, I would say. Mm. And also the support of the multidisciplinary team, trained professionals, trained clinical psychologists, trained mental health nurses, you know, trained mm. speech and language therapists, pharmacists who are trained in mental health. We don't have that. Um, in Nigeria. We have clinical psychologists, we have mental nurses, but not as much as um, they have in the UK. 
Well, I think one positive though is in Nigeria, if you'll be a mental health nurse, you do your general nursing training first and then subspecialize. Mm. So I think Nigerian nurses okay. have a good grasp of physical health issues. Mm. I, perhaps this is just my own experience. So don't quote me that this is the UK, but this is my own experience. That's back home. I could, um, yeah, I, I, I expect my nurses, my nursing colleagues to know about physical health issues. Whereas here, I find that um, many times the nurses come to me as a doctor seeking advice about um, physical health issues that I would have mm -hmm. ordinarily felt, oh, but you should, you should, uh, as a nurse, you should know this. You should be able to do blood, you should be able to do ECGs and things like that. So here in the UK, okay. they do special special trainings for that. So you're a nurse and then you go do some short course to be able to take blood, some short course to do ECGs. Um, Whereas I think our own nurses at home are more have a more broad based um, training and they were okay. better generalists. I think that I think the mental health act also makes a lot of difference um, in the UK. We have a mental health act now in mm -hmm. Nigeria, which is which is good. It's now been I think signed into law. I don't know if we're using it yet, um, but the last one we had was I think the lunacy act of the military era. So so it's a positive that we have you know, something on paper now. Well, many people have criticized mm. it, that it's not culturally sensitive. It's just uh, like copying what they do in the West and it's not taking into account properly the peculiarities mm. of the African society, which is okay. the next thing I want to say, that at home, you, you have this cultural support for mental health, don't you? Um, yeah. Here, it's not, it's not like that. So you have more paid carers here. Back home, you don't have family members just take care of, the, of their loved ones and they're not paid for that. They should be paid for that. Mm. So it's a positive that people are paid here because it's a lot of work. Mm. But at mm. some people just say, oh, yeah. it's, it's my wife. Oh, it's my husband. It's my son. It's my father. It's my mom. Why should I be paid? You know, and they just take it on and the whole community takes it on. In fact, the whole idea of community psychiatry that is now um, very, very public, everyone talking about community services, some of these things were pioneered in Nigeria in the 60s, village psychiatry at Haru, mm. Abel Kuta. yeah, some of these things were pioneered there, you know. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just always fascinating when I hear people talking about community psychiatry here in the UK. I'm like, well, we've been doing that since the 60s, you know. So. <laughs> Yeah, so those are some of the differences. Uh, but of course, you know that Nigerian psychiatry is patterned after British psychiatry anyway. So there are a lot mm -hmm. of commonalities. The books we use are the, relatively the same. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so there's a lot of commonalities. If you're, if you're Nigerian listening and you're thinking, oh, will I be able to survive in the UK system? I think it would be an almost seamless transition for you. Okay. Wow, this has been so insightful so far. I don't know about you watching out there. Um, I've really learned a lot, and I think he's probably trying to make me consider becoming a psychiatrist, really, <laughs> with, with all that he's talked about. But well, we'll see how it goes. So, um, uh, can you tell us, um, can you give advice to IMGs out there, um, considering probably psychiatry in the UK? I know you've you've got. Yeah, wealth of experience really so far. But in terms of career progression, you know, for some doctors, it's all about I finished medical school, I'm entering residency training, I'm going to become a specialist, I'm going to become a consultant, and like that's that's it. Um, for someone at the beginning of the process, um, can you give some advice about career progression at least to get them to think, you know, forward as to yeah what they could do is there anything you think you could have done early earlier than now things like that well for me i i don't think so i think since mm -hmm. i've always wanted to be a psychiatrist i started out after um medical school did my primaries in nigeria i forgot to say the paper hey is similar to the primary mm -hmm. fellowship exam of the west africa college of physicians um that we do in oh. west africa yeah so the paper hey here is similar to the primary exam is the same thing, okay. really. Uh, mm. Not the same, but you know, it's the same. The same subjects are examined. So I did that okay. immediately after medical school. Um, yeah, 
after, yeah, just after I was job while waiting for my National Youth Service, which is the FY2 equivalent here. Then after the National Youth okay. Service, I did a, an MO job, then um, started psychiatry training. But that wasn't mm -hmm. anything I, I could have done. I've applied to other to several training programs, but I didn't get a place. So if there was anything I could mm -hmm. have done better, is I wouldn't have done one year of being a general medical officer. I would have just gone straight into psychiatry. Um, okay. I also was lucky. My my uh, center was an academic, very academic. So I published my first first couple of papers in Nigeria before I came here. So that was also mm. that's also, also something you can start doing now. Find mm. an academic center if you're interested in research. I was also teaching medical students um, back home, which I've continued here. So most of the things I'm doing here were things I was doing back home. So, wow. so so what that means is, yeah, just if you've made up your mind that you want to do psychiatry, just start. Just start the process. Don't say I have to do it until I get. To, I have to wait till I get to the UK. You can start from wherever you are. Um, do the exams. Whatever experience of psychiatry you have, wherever you are, will be a positive when you come to the UK. So, so what you said maybe in terms of progression. So after medical school, FY1, FY2, then you do core training, um, and then you can immediately go into higher training and they become a consultant. Mm. Some people don't do that. So they do medical school, FY1, FY2. They could do FY3 or things like junior clinical fellowship in psychiatry to see if they really like it. Um, okay. Yeah, so you can do that. It's not a training post. There are some post called locum appointment for service. So say there are 20 mm. training posts and only 18 gets filled. They can offer two out as a service provision post. But um, it's similar to the mm -hmm. pay and everything is similar to being a trainee. So you could do that. You're not mm -hmm. in an official training program, but you are getting a feel for the training program before you then apply for the training. Some other people finish core training, pass the exams. Some maybe they've not passed the exams. They then work as specialty doctors. So they are specialists, but not mm -hmm. consultants. Um, so they are middle grade doctors who can, yeah, do of course they have the, the same knowledge a core trainee would have that the registrar would have but rather than continuing the training program um they just yeah they just want to work some people prefer that for work-life balance because they want to stay in the same place they don't want to move the family some people just don't want to be the consultant they feel there's really no need to be that so that's an opportunity that's another okay. option that some people pursue then i should also talk about academic psychiatry again this is general to all of training in medicine there are academic um, clinical okay. academic posts that you can apply for the mm -hmm. same way you apply for clinical posts um, academic clinical fellowships academic clinical lectureships so some of them are divided i think the fellowships are is it 50 50 now 50 percent academics 50 percent um, mm. um clinical and then you get a master's or a phd when you're done and then the clinical okay. lectureship you must have a phd before you apply for that and i think that's 25 percent um, clinical 75 percent research so so that's wow. an option if you want a straightforward clinical academic um, career um, what I'm doing is not that. So you can also do your normal clinical work, but on the side, using your special interest op um, opportunities, you can then do your research and your clinical, clinical academic um, duties then and develop your, your, your portfolio in that regard. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is, okay. I, I think this is specific to psychiatry. The many roads, you know, lead to the market, as we say in Africa. So there's no one <laughs> just, no, this is the only way, but the, the various ways of achieving the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, that's brilliant. You talked about um, some special interests and in some specialties. I know there may be many out there, but can you just give us a fair idea of, you know, other things aside probably general adult psychiatry? What, what are some of the subspecialties out there that okay. may not necessarily be available, you know, in other countries? Yeah. Yeah. yeah again, I think UK is um, very, very unique in these. Most other countries, you have general psychiatry and then CAM. So that's child and adolescent mental health services. In the UK, after you've done your core training, which is the broad based training, there are six different subspecialties. So you could be a an adult psychiatrist, so that's like the general psychiatry, could be a child and adolescent mental health 
calm psychiatrists, you could do forensic psychiatry, um, you could do, um, which other ones now, you could do intellectual disabilities, you could specialize in the psychiatry of intellectual disabilities, you can do psychotherapy, yeah. okay. and then there is a sixth one, okay. which I can't rem remember now. Um, so there's general, okay. there is CAMS, there is intellectual disabilities, there's forensic. Um, yeah, I can't remember the last one. And then, uh, then old age, old age psychiatry. Okay. That's the last one, old age psychiatry. Uh, and oh, then as, okay. oh, right. wow. Yeah, then as a general psychiatrist, you could also sub or super specialize in substance misuse, in consultation liaison psychiatry, um, and I think perinatal psychiatry. Um, I think those are some of the super specializations. Um, and also neuropsychiatry, mm -hmm. I think, is a super specialization also. But on the RC Psych web website, all of this is clearly okay. yeah, written there. So some of the things I may have mixed up, you'll find accurate information on the RC Psych um, website. But that is okay. not a special interest that I was saying. This is just oh, some specialization. So yeah, it's different. Mm. So, yeah, during your IR training, you have two sessions per week for your special interests. So some people do research, some people do medical education, some people use that to you know, develop their competencies in psychotherapy, um, in leadership, um, yeah, in maybe neurology, if you have special interest in neurology or neurophysiology or eating disorders or something niche, or even something as interesting as culture and psychiatry. You could use your special interest for that. You could even develop a bespoke special interest portfolio for yourself and say, I want to understand um, sleep studies. So I want to I want to sleep some more uh, uh, for those two sessions. That's just <laughs> a joke. <laughs> but really, you could, you could do whatever you like. You have to dis discuss with your educational mm -hmm. supervisor and together you agree on how you want to spend your special interest sessions. In fact, You've blown my mind. This it's just been 30 minutes, but the wealth of information you shared, um, it's it's so 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 valuable. You know, sometimes you go to the website, you start reading stuff and lots and lots of information reading, you, yeah. you just don't really get everything. But you've made everything so easy to appreciate and to understand. And I'm really grateful for, for this. I know people out there watching as well have also been educated. They found this insightful as well. Um, so Perfect. as we conclude, <laughs> as we conclude, I was just wondering if you just want to um, give viewers out there a take home message, maybe something you just want to share with doctors out there. Any, any yeah. last words? Yeah, so so I know that not everyone would want to be a psychiatrist, but the best doctors eventually will be psychiatrists. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a joke, but uh, more seriously now, some of the things you learn mm -hmm. as a psychiatrist um, are skills that you know you, you can use, you know, in whatever subspecialty of medicine you choose. You choose wow. to specialize, yeah. and what we focus on being patient-centered, being humane, listening to patient, developing sp um, specialist skills in listening, um, in you know, collaborating with the patient and the family and the wider system around them. Um, those are skills yeah. that every doctor needs. So even if you don't want to do mm. psychiatry for the rest of your life, come for a taster session. Do three weeks you know okay. do six months of psychiatry see if you like it if you don't like it that's fine yeah okay oh uh, thank you so much i appreciate your time i am so grateful in fact words fail me to express my gratitude to and You're welcome. I, I wish you the very best in all that you are doing i know you're an amazing doctor you've talked about books you've authored if, I, if you're happy, we could share, you know, links to, to those books. I don't know if you're happy on, on their channel. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. In case yeah. viewers want to, yeah, viewers want to have a look. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy yeah, to do that. Um, so, yeah, just, okay. just one that's been published. Um, One will be, will be published this August. And I don't know when the other one, the third one will oh. be published. So the one that's been published is um okay. the, it's part of the Oxford Cultural Psychiatry Series. And it's the... Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. I, I don't know the name offhand, um, but it's about um, psychiatry of intellectual disabilities 
in various cultures. So that's the title, but I'm, I'm mm-hmm. going to give you a link to that. Uh, maybe also you can put it in the oh, description right. for people. The okay. other one is the prescribing guideline specifically for people with intellectual disabilities who then have psychiatric problems. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's in fact, in the English speaking okay. world, that's, I think, the only prescribing guideline for people with um, developmental disorders. So it's a very important mm-hmm. text for people to, to have. Okay. Okay, viewers, I'll be dropping all the links in the description area. Please do have a look. Um, please help me appreciate Dr. Yumipo by posting in the comment section as well. And I believe we will host him again. Definitely, I've learned so much in, in a few minutes and it's been a very exciting conversation. I, I believe you would all agree with me out there. So thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. And... and I hope to host you again on the channel someday. Yeah, I'll be very happy to, to come again once once you're back on. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.